Good to see everybody here this morning. Look forward to our time of worship together. Let's take our chorus book and turn to the back. The hymn, Take Me As I Am. Is what we're going to sing. Take me as I am. Jesus, my Lord, to thee I cry. Unless thou help me, I must die. Oh, bring my freeing salvation nigh and take me as I am. And take me as I am. And take me as I am. My only plea, Christ died for me. Oh, take me as I am. Helpless I am and full of dread, but yet for me thy blood was shed, and thou canst make me what thou wilt, and take me as I am, and take me as I am. And take me as I am. My only plea, Christ died for me. Oh, take me as I am. No preparation can I make. My best resolve I only break. Yet save me for thy own name's sake, and take me as I am, and take me as I am, and take me as I am. My only plea, Christ died for me, Oh, take me as I am. Behold me, Savior, at thy feet. Deal with me as thou seest me. Thy work begin and thy work complete. And take me as I am. And take me as I am, and take me as I am. My only plea, Christ died for me, oh, take me as I am. Most people think they've got to do something to clean themselves up a little bit present themselves before God and even some that say yes it is Christ and then they add that little word but but I need to do something also myself and that's not what the gospel teaches we're either saved in Christ or we're not we're either righteous in him or we're not and truly when we sing my only plea is that Christ died for me so take me as I am in him. And I'll tell you, he's a sure advocate, he's a sure refuge. This is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptation that Jesus Christ came into the world not to save the righteous, but to save sinners, Paul said. And he also added, of whom I am chief. And that was toward the end of his life. That was after having been raised up to preach Christ everywhere. He knew that his only plea that when Christ came to this world, it was to die for such a sinner as he was. Therein is the good hope. Well, let's take our Bibles and look in Proverbs chapter 6. And we're going to read from verse 12 down to verse 19. And I want to speak with you about symptomatic heart failure. That sounds like a pretty daunting title. 
but when I read this portion, you'll understand. We're not talking here about physical heart failure, but spiritual. And I can tell you that without a doubt, every one of us is dealing with a heart disease spiritually. And when we read here from verse 12 down to verse 19, don't be thinking about somebody else. So often when you read scripture, you're thinking, oh, I wish so-and-so was listening right now. Or, now this is me. This is you. We're all in a room here together, and the word is directing the light of the x-ray on, on these hearts of ours. Now, one of us can say, oh, no, that doesn't pertain to me, if we're dealing honestly before the Lord. So how bad is it? Well, here it says in verse 12 of Proverbs 6, a naughty person, a wicked man, walketh with a froward mouth. He winketh with his eyes, he speaketh with his feet, he teacheth with his fingers. Forwardness is in his heart. There it is, the heart failure, the heart disease. He deviseth mischief continually, he soweth discord. Therefore shall his calamity come suddenly. Suddenly shall he be broken without remedy. These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look. Anybody here ever had a proud look? Symptomatic. Heart disease. A lying tongue. Anybody here that like to raise their hand and said they'd never lie? Hands that shed innocent blood. You say, well, I've never ever killed anybody, so I can get a check on that. Wait a minute. What did Christ say there on the Sermon on the Mount? If you so much as think of somebody and say, thou fool, in your heart, doesn't mean have to come out of your mouth, you're guilty of hellfire. So, whoa, check that one. A heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. Anybody have an issue with heart thoughts? Even though you never say anything outwardly, but you think it. Feet that be swift in running to mischief. You ever catch yourself and think afterward, now why did I do that? A false witness that speaketh lies. And he that soweth discord among brethren. Let's have a word of prayer. Gracious Father, what a solemn portion of Scripture, especially when we read it in light of who we are, knowing ourselves to be sinners indeed. But even that is part of the lie when we refuse to believe that we're as bad or evil as what your word says. We want to live in denial or somehow try to cover it up with religious acts that are just outward and in no way can cleanse these hearts. I pray, dear Father, that through this study you would enable us to see more than ever our need of the work of your blessed Son. How great must be that sin if it took you sending your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, into this world to pay the sin debt at Calvary for those that you've purposed to save. And I acknowledge that were you to let us continue to go our way as we're born in this world, certainly our end would be sudden destruction and being ushered into eternity to face your eternal condemnation. Oh Lord God, I pray that as we sit quietly, even now, in your presence, that you would cause our hearts to yearn after your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Give us eyes to see and to bow to him who is the great physician, the one who came and lived that perfect life and shed his precious blood that you might be a just God and declare righteous, 
sinners such as we are. So we wait quietly, silently before you, dear Father, and look to you to teach us as we spend this time in your word. I give you the thanks and the praise in the name of your dear and blessed Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I remember years ago, and I was feeling pretty spunky, energetic, went in to see the doctor. This man had a crew cut. He was fit as a fiddle. And he was going over my test results that I got back, blood tests. I found that I found out those tests don't lie because life is in the blood. So they have ways today of breaking it down and looking at your whole health spectrum just from what that sheet of paper says about your blood cells. And I remember sitting there and him asking me, do you know what heart disease is? And I said, well, I think I do. And he said, well, tell me what it is. And so I said to him, well, it's when you've had a heart attack and you survived and now you're trying to get over it. And he goes, wrong. It's everything that leads up to that heart attack. And he said, you have heart disease. So he told me, and I'm thinking, I feel fit as a fiddle. In fact, that back then I was refereeing my boys soccer team running up and down the field. Just felt like I was a picture of health. I said, well, explain that. He said, you've got three strikes against you. One is your family history, medical history. Because I see here that you had a grandfather that died of a heart attack and you've got, so you've got history. That's number one strike against you. The number two strike against you is that you've got high blood pressure and high cholesterol. And now they've added triglycerides on top of it. So there's two strikes against you. And then the third thing that you have against you is you've got a stressful life, stressful job, a lot of things going on, and all that continues to affect your heart. And he said, there's got to be some changes made. Well, that's been almost 20 years ago now. And guess what? Still have the same issues. <laughs> And the more I go see the doctor, the more he says, well, a lot of this is genetic. But I got thinking about that in terms of spiritual heart disease. Because when you talk about family history, where did our spiritual heart disease begin? All the way back there in Adam. By one man, sin entered into the world. And what? Death by sin. And so death passed upon all men. It's interesting how that's put. It's like a one-time judgment. It doesn't say sin is passing upon all men, but sin passed. So that means when Adam fell, this was already a settled matter. From that point forward, everyone that is born of the seed of Adam is born with this spiritual deadness heart failure, symptomatic heart failure. That's what it is. It's not even like the physical where it leads up to a heart attack per se, or you spend your life recovering from one. The scriptures pointed out as even being worse. We're born in deadness. We're born alienated from the life of God. We're born already with the death sentence in this heart. And so it's not a matter even of working with it and trying to improve it and avoid some sort of heart attack. Nothing short of spiritual life given by the Spirit of God is going to raise this heart out of deadness and cause us to be able to live unto God. That's how bad it is. In fact, to ignore this is to do so at our own peril. I noticed here as it was describing the symptoms, because that's the what we're reading here in these verses 12 through 19. And we'll come back to these in a little bit, but look at verse 15. Therefore shall his calamity come suddenly. 
suddenly shall he be broken without remedy. There are many, many people that think that they've got a handle on their heart because they're alive, they reason, they think, and so in their conscience, they know, they think in their minds the difference between good and bad, and so I'm going to try to be good. You know, how many people say that? I'm, I'm trying to be good. The problem is what God's holiness requires is absolute perfection. It's not a trying. It's unless you have that which answers to God's holiness in every way, not just in word and deed, but thought. So I hear so many people say, well, I hope when I stand before God, my good deeds outweigh my bad. Whoa, wait a minute. How about, how about your thoughts? Look how much of this here has to do, first of all, with the thoughts that then affect the action. The problem is that this heart disease, the deadness of this heart, if left without remedy, in other words, by God's grace, giving the sinner his spirit and literally raising that sinner from the dead, spiritually, and causing them to run to Christ. Without that, there is no remedy. And such will be cut off suddenly. You notice in verse 15, twice, suddenly. Suddenly. It's like somebody you heard about, they seen the picture of health, and then all of a sudden you hear they died of a heart attack. And you're thinking, what? Just saw him yesterday. Suddenly. That's physically. Suddenly. The soul passes from this life into eternity. And unless there's an answer to a holy God that is not within ourselves. See, that's where Paul, writing the Galatians, because they were looking back to the law. They were thinking somehow by their obedience to the law that they could add to the work of Christ and find favor with God. And Paul told them pretty plainly, he said, if righteousness come by law, in other words, one's obedience to the law, Christ is dead in vain. You're as much as saying that Christ didn't need to come. I got this. <laughs> you talk about haughtiness. You talk about a proud look, as it says there in verse 17. That's a proud look right there. Look with me at a couple of scriptures before we dig down a little bit in these verses. Look at Jeremiah chapter 17. Because many people are like I was sitting in that doctor's office when he told me you have heart disease. I was incredulous. In fact, I was going to prove him wrong. I was ready. I don't care what figures you got. No, you got you got the wrong person here. That's what we think in our own mind sometimes. I, I can beat this thing. And that in and of itself shows hardening of the arteries spiritually. That just shows right there. You're nothing but a dead man walking, especially when it, things pertaining to God. Because I know when, when we read this, Honestly, in your heart, can you tell me that you truly believe that you're as bad as what is written here? Most of us don't. And that's the deception. That's the deception of the heart. Maybe that's applying to somebody else, but not me. Look at what the scriptures say. Here's the doctor's report. It says here in verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things. Now, when you think about deception, it's subtle, isn't it? If someone were to come up to you and tell you, I'm here to tell you a lie, your ears perk up. If somebody truly wants to deceive you, and today we're with the internet and other things, they're, they're talking about all kinds of ways that people are getting hacked and identity stolen. Does anybody just willingly say, I want to be deceived? No, it's subtle. And then when you find out about it, you go back and think, wow, that's what caused that? 
That's what this word deceitful means. That in the face of that evil, you can't even perceive it as evil. And desperately wicked who can know it that's the heart I'll tell you the greatest deception today this may shock some of you it's not in the bars it's not in the prostitute houses it's not out there on the bridge with the homeless the greatest deception today is in places of worship where week in week out day in day out people are being told it's okay you just say this little prayer, and if you really mean it, then you can be as sure of heaven as your own name. And people go out of that doctor's office, false doctor's office, feeling like, oh, okay, good. That's all it was. Without ever perceiving that right there in that false religion, what they're being given is fig leaves. You imagine if People came to death and said, come naked, number one, and number two, we're going to hand out fig leaves. You're like, what? You'd say, that, that's ridiculous. No. But that's exactly what is going on right now at this hour where many people are naked. They're naked and don't know it for holy God, and they've got a fig leaf covering that somebody gave them that just like in the fall in the garden will not stand up to the holiness of God. In fact, that was the mercy to Adam and Eve. Someone asked me the other day, they said, what well, do you think Adam and Eve were saying? I said, the Lord has never shed blood in vain. The very first blood shed in all of history was that of an innocent animal that the Lord took and clothed Adam and Eve to cover their nakedness. And it was a picture of what would take place thousands of years later when the Lord Jesus Christ would come in the world. But there's the deception of the hearts. And even as I say this, were it not for the Spirit of God, I would not believe that I'm as bad as what this says. I know that because I lived in that deception for nearly 30 years of my life before the Lord did strike me with a heart attack. Laid me low caused me to see that all of those years of running and striving, even believing the message of so-called grace and believing a message that said, yeah, it's by Jesus that you'll be saved. But the subtle deception was in my heart, it was him plus whatever else I can bring. I was raised to believe that up to the point of your profession, all that's taken care of from there backward. But now, from there forward, you better watch out. And that's the subtle deception of what's being preached today. Yes, when you confess your sin, that but you've got to keep confessing because you've got to use that spiritual bar of soap every day to make sure that you keep yourself clean. It's all you, you, you. That's part of the deception. I liken that to give an aspirin to somebody that's got a terminal illness. It might make them feel better for a while, but it doesn't cure the disease. I'll tell you, there's only one remedy to this heart disease, and that is the blood shed of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's just how holy God is. It demanded for God to be just. It demanded that his son should pay the debt. And that having paid the debt, now God is satisfied with those for whom he paid the debt. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Because this goes along even here, what we're reading in Proverbs 6.12. In verse 14 it says, Forwardness is in his heart, he deviseth mischief continually. Therein is the deception of many in their heart, because they think, well, from time to time I have an evil thought. Really? Time to time. Is there ever a time, whether you're conscious of it or not, that you can say that this heart isn't evil? The answer of Scripture is never. Never. Even now. It would be a deception for me to think that somehow, since I'm God's child, 
and the Spirit of God has regenerated me, that now my thoughts are pure. I'll tell you this, it's just the contrary. See, before someone turns on the light, you don't see the, the dirt. You're not a, aware of just how bad things are until someone turns on the light. And now that the light is on, the closer you get to the light, you're not going to see purity. You're going to see more and more sin. I said that to someone one time, and they were just staring at me like, what are you talking about? And that is, I see myself more as a sinner today than I ever did. Right now. When I come to this word, the Lord is, he will not allow me to read this and look anywhere else but here. And so, when Solomon is describing the evil, of this life, look at verse 3, Ecclesiastes 9, verse 3. This is an evil among all things that are done under the sun, that there is one event unto all. In other words, all die. It doesn't matter. Living a moral life, so called, does not guarantee you a long life on this earth more than one that's out there living it up in the world. In fact, in many cases, as Solomon points out, those that seem upright die young. God takes them out. And those that live an evil life, they some live to be a hundred. That's, but in the end, all have one event, that is death. Yea, also, Notice, the heart of the sons of men is full of evil, and madness is in their heart while they live, and after that they go to the dead. Now, let me ask you, are you a son of man? It says sons of men without distinction. Well, if we're here, we weren't hatched. We weren't brought in as aliens. We were born sons of Adam. So, I can't escape that when it says the heart of the sons of men is full of evil. And then there's some that say again, well, but yes, if the Lord saves you by his grace and regenerates you, that's when it stops. Really? Because here it says, and madness is in their heart while they live. Paul wrote about this in Romans chapter 7. And some try to argue around it and say, well, he was really talking about there in Romans 7, O wretched man that I am, before he was converted. But he didn't say, O wretched man that I was. He said, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? So he recognized even in his life there as a regenerated, justified sinner before God, yet the madness in the heart never die. I'll tell you, the, this flesh is not going to change. The only thing that is going to bring a halt to the depravity of this flesh is death itself. It's when they lay your body in the grave, or today the save, save cause, cremation. That's when, isn't that what the scripture says? And madness is in their heart while they live. Am I still alive right now? Am I a son of Adam? Yes. Well, then that madness is still there in that heart. It says after that, they go to the dead. You know, when Paul says there, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Back in the era when they would arrest somebody, some of the, the most severe criminals, they would actually tie them up to, they'd pair them up in twos, chain them together. And it was just random. You're, you're chained with this one. It could be a murderer that you're chained to, but you're chained to them. You go to bed and sleep, you get up, you eat. It's with that person chained to you. And if that person should die, 
the guards didn't come immediately and say, well, okay, let's let's take you off here because we don't we don't want you dragging a dead body around. You literally, until that government determined or those soldiers determined that you were going to be free of that, you literally continued to drag that body around. Even if you had to pick it up and go get something to eat, you were carrying that body. That's the reference that Paul is using there when he says, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? That's why I said ever since the spirit of grace has begun this good work in me, I acknowledge that I am carrying around in this body death itself, madness itself, corruption itself. I know people try to run from it. They think, well, I'm just going to change environments. I'm going to come over here and hopefully there'll be a little less corruption. Well, wherever you move, guess what? You're taking that dead body with you. And when you realize that, that's where God by his spirit causes you to cry out just like with Paul. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ, my Lord. How? Well, in his perfect life and his obedient death, whereby God then declares righteous everyone for whom he paid the debt. Some people say, well, there's a little period of time, age of accountability. You ever hear that? Look over in Psalm chapter 58. Again, I used to believe this because when you see a newborn child, you look at that child, he seems so innocent. <laughs> but I like what somebody said, they're nothing but vipers and diapers. Eventually, the venom comes out. You see it. But it's been there from the beginning. Look here in uh, Psalm 58. Notice, well, let's go in verse 1. Do ye indeed speak righteousness, O congregation? Here's addressed to people that, like I said, the greatest place of deception is in places of worship, where people feel like, He's there. They've got some kind of righteousness. They're being good. Do ye judge uprightly, O ye sons of men? There it is again. Who's not a son of man? Yea, in heart you work wickedness, and you weigh the violence of your hands in the earth. Here it is. The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies. And their poison is like the poison of a serpent. See, there it is, vipers and diapers. They are like the deaf adder that stoppeth her ears, which will not hearken to the voice of charmers, charming never so wisely. We've all seen those snake charmers with their little pipes in this. Out comes it. But this is so bad, not even the charmer. And, charm. and that's how it's described in the heart. And it's true. This is from the womb. So what we have here, coming back to my text in Proverbs chapter 6, we have the symptoms of those of us, not them, those of us who from birth have symptomatic heart failure. That Symptomatic just means all the symptoms are there. It's indicative, it's, it's characteristic, it's typical. You're looking at it, evidence in front of you, and say, yep, heart failure. That's what we have here. So what are these symptoms of spiritual heart disease? In verse 12, it describes us as naughty people. That's normally something you say to a child, you're being naughty. But in reality, it applies to anybody that's in this flesh, child or adult. And one word describes the next, a naughty person, that is a wicked person, and one that walks with a forward mouth, out of the heart the mouth speaks. 
And we've learned, again, in fig leaf religion, to stop our mouth. Oops, I didn't mean to say that, or I better not say that. Ever have somebody stop and tell you that? And I always tell you, you might as well say it, you thought it. Oh, I don't think I could say it. Well, then, how does that change anything? It's still in your heart. A naughty person is actually, the word there means someone that's worthless. And here's again the deception, because people don't like that term concerning themselves. They like to believe, oh, you're talking about somebody else. But in our sin, we are absolutely worthless. Have no value with regard to God or his holiness or righteousness, none. That's why Paul said there's none righteous. He had to remind the Jews of that because they were thinking, well, don't compare us to the Gentiles. We at least have the oracles of God. We got all this history. He said, it doesn't matter. Apart from Christ, you're all the same. The Jews were used to calling the Gentiles dogs. We're the, we be the circumcision, they said. That, that was their thing. Their claim to fame was their circumcision, the sign that God gave to Abraham. So for that reason, again, an outward ceremony, they believed that somehow that made them better than somebody else. See, the Samaritan woman had to learn that because she was kind of cocky herself when the Lord met her at the well in John 4. She was talking about where they worshipped there in Mount Gerizim and the Jews they worshipped over here. And God said, time comes when none of that matters. What matters is going to be that God seeks those that worship him in spirit and truth. To worship him in Christ, who is the truth. So a naughty person is one that is worthless. A wicked person is one that is lawless. And a forward person is one that is perverse in all that he does, not just in some things, but in everything we do. Realize when the scriptures talk about our depravity, it's not saying that we act and think and speak as bad as we could be. What it means, though, is that everything we do is from this corrupt source, this corrupt spring, this corrupt heart, and therefore taints everything we do. That's why there's none righteous. Isaiah 64, 6 says, all of our righteousnesses Anything we consider to be just before God are what? Filthy rags. A putrid, stinking rag. Try setting that on the table when you have some guests over. And think, we'll just put it at the end. They won't. Boy, that's the last thing you're thinking of. Get rid of that rag. But that's what the scriptures describe as our righteousness. So this is what is symptomatic of heart disease. And then verse 13, again, symptoms, the outworking it. He winketh with his eyes. When someone winks, what are they saying? Let's just, it's nothing serious. You'll be okay. You might say something and just wink at somebody. And they're like, oh, okay. He didn't really mean it. That's how this heart expresses itself. Don't worry about it. Can't be as bad as what it says. He winketh with his eyes, he speaketh with his feet. <laughs> Body language. That's a whole science these days. There's people that go and get their degrees in body language. I saw a documentary the other day how people that are borders and customs, they're taught to look for certain signs of people. Because if you're lying, something's happened. And I believe that's speaking with your feet. It used to be this way with my kids. You know, if I was zeroing in on something they didn't want to tell me about, their feet were just shuffling. <laughs> just shifting, shifting. They didn't have to say anything. I knew something was up because their feet were talking. And when you point out to them, you know, you're doing a lot of shifting around. Or if somebody's sitting, they're, they're, they're crossing their leg, they're uncrossing. The feet are talking. All that is is just covering. In fact, every one of these, winking with the eyes, speaking with the, the feet, and teaching with the fingers. That's another thing they say, watch the hands. Because the hands are speaking. 
if someone's lying, you just watch their hands. They're cracking their knuckles. They're, they're, there's something going on here with the, with the fingers that is indicating there's a problem. All of this is indicative of, as it says there in verse 14, again, these are symptoms. Forwardness or perverseness, that's what the word forward means, to be perverse. And where's the problem? In the heart. See, most people, when they make their resolutions, they're trying to curb the habit as far as outward things. I'm going to, from here forward today, I'm going to determine to control my tongue. Let's just take that as a, a project for today. So I'm not going to say anything that's going to provoke anybody or that is going to in any way disparage, and most of the time, me. People worried about people thinking well of them. So today, I'm going to control my tongue. Well, guess what? The tongue is a member that's connected to as James says, hell itself. And so, whether or not you make it even through a day, which is questionable, I always say that works until the very first phone call you get, and then all of a sudden you start raising your voice, and why did you have to call me, and I don't need this right now, and da 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 da, -da. there goes the tongue flapping. Where does that come? But from the perverseness of the heart. But I'll tell you, even more forward than that, as we think in terms of how we speak to others, do you realize how much forwardness is in the heart when it comes even to worship? When we sang that hymn to begin with today, did you think about the words, take me as I am? Or was it just thought, oh, well, that's a catchy tune, and here we go, sing it, without ever thinking about really what that's saying. That we are seeking the Lord that he would receive us just as we are. How are we but sinners? Not as righteous, but sinners. Not trying to fix ourselves up, but coming as we are before him. But the forwardness of the heart, and there where it says he, he deviseth mischief continually, he sowed discord, Devising mischief continuously is to continue down a way to pretend that somehow I'm improving myself when I'm not. And you want to have discord. Look in works religion where one person is comparing themselves with another. And they're saying, well, if you just had as much faith as I did, you wouldn't be living that way. Or you wouldn't be thinking that way. Follow me. Use me as an example. And there's a dividing, a discord where some set themselves above others, when in reality we're all dead dog sinners. Nothing but wretched sinners before a holy God. But the forwardness of the heart, again, takes us back to that fig leaf religion. It would make us believe somehow we're better than someone else, and we're not. So there's a lot there that, that we can look at, but suddenly such, it says calamity, comes upon. So the sum of it here in verses 16 through 19, and the consequences of the spiritual heart disease, that's the sudden calamity. That word suddenly there in verse 15, it literally means to be shattered as a potter's vessel without hope of recovery. We used to sing that little or say that poem, Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall, Humpty Dumpty had a great fall, all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Dumpty back together again. There are a bunch of dead men walking around this world. Now, I may even be speaking to some right now that when suddenly the Lord executes his judgment, takes them out into eternity, that's it. It's without remedy. People can light candles all they want to. They can, even now, people say, well, say a prayer for them. That matter's settled. It's settled. If they weren't the Lord's in this life, one for whom Christ paid the debt, and that's what we sang about in that hymn, Take Me As I Am. My only hope, my only plea, is that when Christ died, he died for me. 
Many that don't have that hope, suddenly, it doesn't matter how long they live, it'll be sudden. They'll be cut off. But the effects of this spiritual heart disease on ourselves and on others, it's described there in 16 through 19. These six things that the Lord hate. It's hard for people to believe that God's a God of hatred. But he said, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. His wrath abides upon the ungodly for whom Christ has not paid the debt. Now if he's paid their debt, his wrath has been removed and he will indeed in time bring them by his spirit to Christ. But to the rest, they'll face nothing but the hatred of God. And you, you read, it says six things, and then he says seven. Six is the number of man in Scripture, so that's describing what man is. And then seven is to completion. And if you look at these things, it has to do with this heart, not only toward men, but toward God himself. See, that's, that's the issue here. You can deal all you want to think, well, I, I gotta make sure I don't have a proud look towards somebody or a lying tongue sort. No, this is talking about toward God. Even when David had sinned, what he said, I've sinned against thee and thee only. Proud look. That, that's what our heart is, a lying tongue. We're prone to believe a lie versus believing the truth. That's why it takes the Spirit of God to teach us the truth. Hands that shed innocent blood will condemn somebody else. In fact, we'll lay our hands on Christ and say, he's the only true innocent blood. When they cried, crucify him, crucify him, they were raising their fists in the face of God. And that was me. They were my representatives. You say, well, how can you escape? Only because that blood was shed for such a wretch as I. Heart deviseth wicked imaginations, feet to be swift and running to mischief, False witnesses speak of lies and sow in discord among the brethren. I'll tell you, those that sow discord among the brethren are those that hold on to their works religion and they hate grace, just like Cain hated Abel. Abel didn't hate Cain. Cain hated Abel. Esau sought to slay Jacob because that birthright had been put on him. It's grace versus works. It's always been the enmity Right from the garden where, where the Lord said that uh, the, the, there would be, he, the Lord put enmity between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. It's always going to be like that. That's where you're going to have discord. You're not going to have discord with those who've been taught by God's grace. Where the discord comes is where the tares come in among the wheat. And because you do not acknowledge them or their works as being anything before God, suddenly now they... They lash out against the breath, against those who are the Lord's. There's a lot here that we could continue to look at, but I pray that what we've heard today, the Lord would use to bring us low, cause us to see our need of Christ and run to him. All right, we'll meet back here in a few minutes.